I, I see quite a few Rosemary people here, and, uh, and one of them just came up to me just, just recently and said, we're here to keep you honest. <laughs> so, um, I hope that we do that. <laughs> Just a, just a little bit about my own personal background. Uh, uh, I grew up in the uh, northeast of Scotland, in a town called Elgin, which is not very far from Inverness. <clears throat> and uh, after graduating at uh, Aberdeen University, I more or less came straight out to Australia for two years, but actually I stayed in 52 years. So I, I landed in Sydney uh, and found a job with the Department of Animal Nutrition and that was for two years and then migrated to uh, Adelaide so uh, then um, Harold Chamberlain of the uh, Department of Agriculture offered me a job he was the superintendent of the research centres with the Department of Agriculture so I, I, I was appointed as a livestock research officer and I looked into problems with uh, land losses and ewe infertility um, then uh, I had a job with the CSIRO for a couple of years. We were looking at the uh, supplementation of cobalt, selenium and copper for ruminants. And that was using the cobalt bullet or the selenium bullet or the uh, pellets. And then uh, after some high school teaching, I landed up at Roseworthy in 1974. And I joined Roseworthy at the same time as uh, Don Williams in January 1974. Don Williams was the principal at that time. So I'll probably start off with just a premise that uh, uh, no man is an island entire of itself, and you probably all hear of that. I've just extended that a little bit uh, to say that no town lives by itself, is completely separate from the rural areas that surround it. The farms and country are a vital part of the town community. The country depends on the town for goods and services and the town depends on the country for farm products and customers. What helps one is bound to help the other. So I hope uh, that it, with that introduction I'll try and flesh out how important Rosalie was for the rural community and for Gawler uh, over the years. And uh, it stems way back to uh, about 19, sorry, 1881 when uh, John Daniel Custance came to Rosalie. And I thought, first of all, I might just flash up a, a slide of Rosalie just in case you don't know where it is. So Rosalie is uh, right on the road to Wasley's, and you can see here an area, a patch there, which covers about uh, uh, 1,200 hectares, from memory anyway. It's probably expanded since then, my time. And I actually left in 1994. <laughs> uh, if you were to go there today, you, uh, and even I'm confused with all the buildings, uh, there's a massive complexes there, and new ones have been added in the last few years, including the Veterinary Research Centre, the Equine Centre, and even an Aqua Centre. And that's on top of all that was there before. And a lot of the buildings are named after people who have contributed to Rosalie's life and, and to the importance of agriculture anyway. Yeah. And if you were to take an aerial view of uh, Rosalind, you would see something like this with the... Uh, this, this complex over here and the Rosalind farms extending quite a bit away to the north and, and to the south. Uh, basically, uh, well, if I take uh, just my time, uh, there was about 1,200 hectares of land and about 500 hectares were given over to cropping of one sort or another, wheat, barley, oats, oil seeds, medics and pastures. And we ran poor short on cattle, dairy cattle, Jersey and Frisian, and pigs and poultry. 
and there were some orchards and vineyards too, but not, not a great deal. Uh, the next slide shows the main building, if you would go there today, and that was established in 1883. So it's the first agricultural college in Australia. And uh, it wasn't actually opened until 1885. So the first students actually, about 15 students, with John Daniel Customs, who had come over from England, Siren Sensor, He's, he went to an agricultural college and he came out and helped to buy the, the college area, the farm at the time, and he took over as principal. Now, <coughs> He was quite uh, upset, I suppose, in terms of what was happening in the rural community. Uh, and the reason for this was that he went, as he went around the rural community and talked with farmers, he realized that uh, the land was very much run down. Uh, there was things like continuous cropping, poor weed control, um, the soils were losing their fertility, and uh, the wheat varieties were very prone to diseases like rust. So these were all big problems that he faced uh, when he landed. And plus he had to establish the, the whole college and start it off. And it was a big task. He said himself that he ran himself uh, almost out of juice as it were. He, he woke up at six and he, he, he worked till about 10 o'clock. And he, he was almost like a one-man band. Unfortunately, he didn't go down well with either the parliamentarians or the farmers because of his probably brash attitude. He would just really tell the farmers, no, look, he was brutally honest, he said, you were ruining the land. And uh, that wasn't really very tactful. It was not what an extension officer should do. So uh, he got into trouble with farmers and he got into trouble with parliamentarians. He was also brash with them. And I, after two years, <laughs> this, uh, sorry, uh, this just actually shows you a slide uh, of the opening, or round about the opening in 1885. So after two years, unfortunately, um, I'm not quite sure what exactly happened, but his position was terminated or he resigned. And I haven't quite worked out how he left the college. But he didn't last too long. Perhaps we'll next slide. Uh, these are just some of the principal, principals who were at the college. I uh, might mention two in particular uh, to try and focus on how important Rosemary was for the rural community. And these were Perkins, Arthur Perkins and uh, Alan Callahan. And <coughs> Uh, well, this is the, uh, the fellow that started it all off, and I, I, I reckon that uh, we have the Custom Centre at Rosalie, and we owe a, a lot to him. It was a big battle to get it going, and despite his personality and his offhandedness, perhaps, he did his best to establish uh, uh, the college, and he, he knew some of the problems that had to be faced. They had to really um, increase the fertility of the soil, like add superphosphate, and to improve the wheat varieties. Those are all problems he brought up and there had to be satisfactory crop rotations in the system to make it worthwhile and satisfactory and sustainable. Yeah. I should say that right at the, the start, the aim was, uh, uh, and many farmers and people were not happy about Rosalie going ahead for some reason, perhaps uh, they knew how to farm and they didn't want to have anyone with scientific principles telling them what to do. Uh, so there was a big, a big stumbling block in the community to try and overcome that hurdle. And as I said before, John Cousins, I don't think he succeeded in doing that. But uh, there is another important, probably two important other pillars to think about right at the start and that was Rosie was a research institution. Um, we should bear in mind that the Department of Agriculture didn't actually form until the turn of the, uh, of the 19th century, or 20th century, I should say. Um, so there was really no uh, active research component 
in the system. Uh, and another thing, of course, that they, the first principles realized quite early on, apart from training young people, was to, ex to be sure that they extended this information to farmers and that there was an interchange between farmers and a communication with them. Uh, <coughs> and I'll just mention a few things to say how easy that was with respect to some of the things that happened. Well, the next fellow that came along, and if I have the slide, thanks Ian, uh, was a chap from my own country. Uh, he, he was uh, William Lowery, uh, who came from Edinburgh. And uh, he was given the position of Professor of Agriculture, and he replaced um, John Custance. And he, he set about doing some of the things that uh, John Custance had proposed. Starting off superphosphate trials, and you can still probably see them at Rosemary today. These were plots of land to test out whether the crops would respond satisfactorily, especially to superphosphate. So he, he started running these trials, but he also started talking to farmers, not in the way that John Custance did, but in a very diplomatic and engaging way. And in fact, he won the hearts, but not straight away, of the farming community in the district, particularly. And uh, people uh, very slowly started applying superphosphate to the soil to increase their wheat yields. And, uh, this was noted, and the word spread, and I think in about, it was about, about uh, 20 years, let's go forward 20 years, 80% of farmers at that time were using superphosphate to increase the yields of uh, the wheat crops in particular, anyway. But there were other problems on the go as well, and one of these was the long following period, um, the keeping of land fairly bare, the overworking of soil and not really having proper rotations. So there were some of the farmers who were actually planting wheat on wheat stubble, for example. And that was really not very good for long-term sustaining of the soil. I, I just read you a comment then, a uh, quote by A.M. Dog, who was a well-known figure in the community at the time. And he went to uh, Rosemary College, I believe, uh, very early on. And uh, he said, Dawkins said that Laurie uh, lectured with so much personality and was so interested in his subject that he would carry it with him. And his lectures were like stories. Um, now, uh, at that time, of course, uh, um, James Martin here in Gawler was manufacturing all, all kinds of agricultural machinery, including strippers, and strippers were very important for harvesting of wheat and other crops. But this is just a little account, and I've taken this from the bunyip, uh, of a student's account of a visit to James Martin. During 1890, the first locomotive built in South Australia by James Martin and Co. Gawler was started and ran down Murray Street. Lord King Tor drove it for the first trip. All students went in to see the festival in the English wagon with four farm, four farm horses. I remember that I was getting a seat and had a rough time on the tailboard. In hopping off at Gawler, a bolt head got the seat of my pants, causing a slit about a foot long. And though others tried to stitch it together, I had to keep an overcoat on all day, and a warm day it was too. Uh, then there's there another one with the student news, and I picked this up, uh, uh, it was about 1890, I think. In response to an invitation of James Martin and co, we visited the above foundry on Saturday, Jan January the 30th. Having just received our new drag, we used it on this occasion for the first time to visit the place of its birth. On reaching Gawler, we were warmly welcomed by the Honorary James Martin. The division into parties was soon accomplished, and each party with its guide was soon threading its way through the maze of wondrous machines and machinery. The first objects that came in view on entering the foundry 
were numerous turning lathes and then machines of every description turning out the different pads of engines, batteries and other fine works of iron. On leaving these we found ourselves in the moulding department and witnessed the moulding of iron and steel. This caused no small amount of interest among the students. Passing on we came to the fitting up of the engines and batteries and wonderful it seemed. We saw the scraps of old iron put into a furnace and heated to welding heat and then beaten into a solid lump by a steam hammer. We also saw and examined the many agricultural implements, but these could not be said to arouse the same amount of interest as the other implements because they are so often seen and used by the students themselves. <coughs> uh, having made an enjoyable and profitable survey of the whole foundry, we were entertained at the old spot to an excellent dinner, dinner provided by the firm. After dinner, the Henri James Martin proposed the toast, the Agricultural College, to which Professor Lowry responded on behalf of the college and Mr. Murray on behalf of the council. After which we were escorted to Mr. Martin's residence where a tennis match was played, Phoenix Foundry versus College. This resulted in a win for the Phoenix. Uh, Professor Lowry correctly ascribed our defeat to the distracting influences of the numerous ladies who witnessed the match. Uh, that was uh, I found later on quite a common complaint uh, if they did lose the uh, tennis match. Uh, along uh, came in Lowry's time uh, Arthur Perkins. And uh, oh, uh, yes, the next slide is up here. I wonder if anyone can actually spot James Martin to, from your memory of James Martin. <laughs> on the actual other side, on the left here, I know that. Ah, yeah. mm -hmm. Professor Lowry, and I, I think this gentleman here is uh, James Martin. in the middle row anyway somewhere. <laughs> we might move on to the next slide. I think. Yeah, that's it. Uh, the transport was by uh, drag, uh, drag, uh, and uh, it's a four-wheeled uh, vehicle. And uh, these students are off to Mount Croft. It's not a very good slide, so try the next slide. Yeah, this uh, Professor Lowry here, he, he is a keen cricketer, so he joined in with the cricket matches. 
And this was part of, uh, I think it's, it's uh, I found out in looking at all the uh, sporting events that there, there was a terrific amount of interest, I think, in sport in these times, possibly because uh, they were confined, if you like, they didn't have transport of any kind. If they did manage to get out, it was usually to football or cricket or some other type of sport. So it, it, there, were a lot of kit, there was a lot of keen competition going on at the time. Um, this is a, a, a game, I think, <coughs> at Prince Alfred College, so they didn't just extend right to Gawler, to the Gawler Association, but also into the city as well. Uh, and this is Arthur Perkins. Now, he came uh, about 1892, and uh, he actually came from Tunisia because his father actually worked there. Uh, he did actually um, study in England and then uh, in, he, he, in, in France. He went to the, uh, if I can pronounce it properly, the Ecole uh, d'Agriculture in France at Mont Montpellier. And so he knew his speciality was in viticulture and he's appoint appointed by the government as the government viticulturalist at that time. Now, he was also Professor of Agriculture, but that was a bit later. Uh, now, that was quite a high position for him, and really, he was in line for being the principal at Rosemary when Lowry left. So that wasn't too long afterwards, but uh, um, he came at, at, uh, at an age of 21, so he was very young, and uh, he stepped into the role and it was a mammoth role for him. He did uh, exceptionally well. He was uh, a, a dynamo of a character. He engaged farmers. He engaged everyone. In fact, all the, pe the people of the day that could help him, he sent letters to them. And to prove it, uh, this book has been written by Jeff Daniels, and these are the letters from about 1880, sorry, 1892 to about 1900. So to people like Thomas Hardy, um, Samuel Davenport at the time was a very well-known figure, uh, to farmers, to the Agricultural Bureau system, to people in the Agricultural Bureau. And I shouldn't mention the Agricultural Bureau because the Agricultural Bureau was an organization that started about uh, 1888 and it was the brainchild of a, a chap called Albert Molyneux and he decided, well he thought that farmers could get together in groups and discuss their problems and perhaps carry out trials to see how well those trials would go for their particular district. Now the important thing about was this was that uh, Arthur Perkins immediately latched onto the Agricultural Bureau system and became part of it. So he was able to engage the farmers and their groups in the neighborhood and help them with the kinds of problems that came up all the time. Just to give you an example of one of the letters he wrote, and I've just taken it from this book, which was written by Jeff Daniels. This is in November 1892. I gave a lecture the other day at a country time over up in the north called Clear, where they are just beginning to go for in fine plantings. Some receive you as an enemy, not openly, but indirect hints, trying to test one, putting what they consider hard questions Inward, inwardly chuckling and saying, I've got them now. And if you communicate anything to the contrary to their stubborn opinions, they, they set you down as no good. It requires a good deal of tact, I can assure you. Some consider me as a miracle me maker, who by simple touch must cure all plant diseases. I tell them to do so and so, they say they will, 
but take good care not, and then behind my back insinuate that I am not worth anything. <laughs> Uh, uh, just to give you an idea of the contact with the Agriculture Bureau and it is an astonishing organization really because uh, in about eight years 80 groups had formed all over Australia, uh, sorry South Australia and uh, uh, that number rose of course later on to well over 100 and these groups of farmers would meet in different districts and then if they had a real problem they would call on someone like Professor Perkins to speak to them about their particular problem. Now, one of the things that we noted with uh, Professor Perkins, he wasn't just interested in viticulture and winemaking, which were his specialities, or horticulture. He branched out into everything possible. Wheat breeding, raising fat lambs, anything you can think, he would throw himself into it. And he was 20 years at the college and then afterwards he spent another 20 years as the Director of Agriculture, uh, Director of the Department of Agriculture in South Australia. Mm. So it's a total of 40 years from his age of 21. Uh, just to give you an idea of the contact uh, with the uh, Gawler River branch, which is a local branch here at the time, and I think it was one of Freeling, uh, of the Bureau, he said, about 20 members of the above branch and visitors paid a visit to the Rose of the Agricultural College. They arrived at 11 a.m. and were received by the Professor Perkins who showed them over a lot of the nearest exper experimental plots of wheat and explained the method he had adopted for the best results by a rotation of crops. Members were greatly interested and asked many questions, all of which were satisfactorily answered by the Professor. Now, he... he uh, he didn't become uh, actually the principal until uh, uh, 1904. In between there was a chap called Batoa who, when um, Laurie resigned, uh, took over for a couple of years, but unfortunately a couple of students broke into the wine cellars and they had to be expelled and there was a lot of, uh, <laughs> well, aftermath I suppose, uh, about all that and poor old Mr. Tower, John Tower, resigned. He'd come from America and he, he'd had enough of students, I think, by then. <laughs> and uh, and the, these problems uh, surfaced from time to time in Rosalie's, just to give you an idea of what happened. It wasn't always plain sailing and progressing evenly, uh, evenly along, going from one stage to another. There were quite a number of rocky stages, setbacks, and this was one of them. And in fact, each time there was a set, setback, the uh, parliamentarians uh, one, one or two of them at least uh, said, oh, we'll, we'll have to cro close Rose with the other thing. We can't keep it going any longer. But out of the blue, then someone would come and uh, raise the standards again. And uh, just to give you an idea how terrible these students were, uh, Bruce Hocking, who was uh, alive about 20 years ago, was a student at this time, and he said, I remember we got into a scrap in Wasley's one time. We went up to play cricket and later went by train up to Hamley Bridge. We went into the pub, you see, which we shouldn't have done. Something happened and Jack Murray got into an argument with somebody and the next thing there was an all-out bout and we cleaned the pub up before you could say knife. <laughs> there was a hell of a row about this, of course. Professor Perkins got us all in there one morning and all the students that went to Hamlet Bridge, he said, well, well, gentlemen, I presume that you've appointed a spokesman. Uh, when you go out to play cricket again, you'll come home as soon as the match is over. Yeah, well, uh, I think that was a fairly mild let off for the students in this case. Yeah, well, um, there were a number of, uh, uh, Professor Perkins uh, started off some winter schools, and farmers came regularly, uh, heaps of farmers to open day and uh, to look at the crops. So there was a lot of interchange and uh, farmers, uh, these are, I, 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 I lost count of the number of these uh, wagons that were coming up the, the track here, but they looked as though there were about 25 on each and possibly about 10 of these wagons. So were, uh, but uh, the winter schools were very popular with farmers and uh, they learned, they wanted to learn and uh, 
I think Lowry had actually set them on the right track and had gauged the farmers and so did Perkins. He was very capable in terms of communicating with farmers. Uh, so this is the, some of the old type of equipment with the horses, yep. pulling the ploughs. And it looked like a binder machine and of course the, the Ridley stripper took over from the binder uh, which would cut the, 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 the long stalks and they'd be thrashed maybe at a machine um, in another place. As, as in this picture here. And <coughs> Perkins was so impressed actually with John, Liddy, John Ridley and what he'd done and so were the students too. And of course James Martin was manufacturing stripper after stripper at the time to try and keep pace with the demand. And the strippers were on the go well before the college opened. And so that just about 80% of the farmers were having uh, these Ridley strippers to uh, harvest their, their wheat crops. And uh, as he was so impressed, or the students were too, they decided to put up a, a statue of John Ridley uh, outside the main building, which you can see today. It took some time for them to gather the money, but eventually they did, and the statue went ahead. A slightly better dressed, I think those students are. Yeah, the principals always made sure they were part of the cricket or football teams in those days especially if they won or did well. Uh, this, uh, yeah, this is a group of students off, probably to Rose Relief, to uh, play against one of the Gawler teams. And this is going on a little bit further. This is what the, uh, about the 1920s, when what Gawler Oval looked like. Good, great. Um, one of the uh, uh, one of the things that uh, Bruce Hawking uh, mentioned, and uh, this was 1910 actually, uh, that uh, the annual ball at Rosalie was a really um, exciting event to look forward to. And I've just made a comment. He, Bruce has made a comment saying they used to invite people who had to be approved by the principal. Names were handed in and they were invited to the ball. The students had to give up their beds for the night and make their own arrangements for accommodation. Some of them used to have a, a spot picked for them in the haystack. <laughs> we met the guests at Rosemary at the drag, this big thing with five horses in it. They were brought out to the college which caused great excitement amongst the boys because these girls turned up. All the dancing was arranged by program, so you used to book your dance before you started. You work hard to get an invitation to somebody's sister or something of the kind. <laughs> uh, I, I think it's quite a different scenario now, as far as I can gather. So, but that, this is going back to those days. And here's another loss, in a, and I think uh, Professor Perkins picked up on Professor Larry, but I'll just read it from the student news again. The professor, evidently with the students' welfare at her heart, once stated in the hearing of a large assembly of the youth and mod beauty of modern Athens, that's Gawler, <laughs> that he was strongly of the conviction that our inferior play on these occasions was in great part due to the distracting influence of the eyes of those young ladies present, to whose charm we, for what reason I fail to understand, are supposed to be peculiarly susceptible. However, I believe he would have been much nearer to the mark in the majority of cases at all events had he said that the bad play was due to the overwhelming hospitality of our host, of which we had taken not wisely, but too well. Uh, uh, I don't know if uh, there are any Latin scholars here. So I'll just read out the Latin motto, and I wasn't aware of this. Maybe my ignorance, but I'll just read out the Latin the motto at the time, if, if I can read it. Et conflabunt gladios suos 
in Vomeres, Ed Lantias, Suas in Falsays. Bruce, would you know what that means? <laughs> no one here? Oh, yeah, oh, you must not have. Et conflabunt gladios suos in vomeres et lancias suas in forces. I did actually take Latin at school, by the way. You forgot to say. No one, no one having a shot at the life of my motto. Anyone roast me? <laughs> no? Okay. I, I didn't know about it either, but that was the motto at the time. I'll read it to you, uh, the, the translation. And they shall turn their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Oh. <laughs> uh, so that's gone by the board, unfortunately. <laughs> and uh, it, it's interesting to note that uh, um, I was talking to Wayne Clark and uh, somehow he mentioned the name of Wayne Clark, who was uh, uh, Brian's friend. <laughs> Once the uh, memorial shifted from uh, oh, my, my. <laughs> South Area to uh, Pioneer Park, I think. Anyway, uh, he, he, he was talking about Tote Old Boers and the commer commer commemoration plaque. Right, I'm speaking. Sorry. In, into the microphone. Uh, uh, to, okay, thank you. Um, with a, with uh, John Hinges and uh, Bruce. May. Now Bruce May was actually the son of uh, Alfred May, also in the engineering business in Waller. And unfortunately he died of an accident in the war. And uh, Tothill was also, he was the son of uh, Mr. I think it was Frederick Tothill. Uh, Mr. Tothill who was the national bank manager of Waller at the time. And he won an entrance scholarship in February 1897 and gained his diploma in February 1900. Um, while at college he proved himself a capital athlete, he was also a prominent footballer. On leaving college, Frank joined the South Australian Bushman's Corps for service in South Africa and was mortally wounded in his first engagement. He died a brave soldier's death and when the sad news reached us, we mourned the loss of one who had endeared him to us all. So, um, there, there was a terrific interest, I think, I, I'm not quite sure why, but uh, there seemed to be, uh, for the Second World War, I think, there's, someone said there was about eight, almost 75 to 80 percent of those at, at, at Rosalie enlisted, whereas in the general uh, public, as it were, it was probably about 30 percent. So a very high percentage of people, and then there was a light horse regiment which was established at that time. And that was very important. There was also a number of rifle teams which uh, were on the go too. And uh, so, in essence, uh, there seemed to be some uh, extra motivation, I suppose, for students who had passed through Rosemary to join up. I just mentioned that by way of interest, I think. Uh, I'd like uh, just to read you the comments made, just a, a comment at this time, maybe going on 20 years after the college was established. And um, this was by Ephraim Kuhn, because I think it sums up the, uh, what's happened in, the, in those first 20 years with the, the establishment, with Lowry, and the, the efforts of Lowry and Perkins in particular. Uh, because Perkins went to 1914 before he joined the Department of Agriculture. So I'll just read you, this was in uh, 1908, so you can imagine the progress now that's been made. The Agricultural College has played an important part in bringing about the prosperity which South Australia has enjoyed of late years. Professor Customs for the first principle gave an early intimation of the suitability of phosphatic manures for the soil of his state. But their use did not become popular until several years later. Professor Lowry demonstrated by his results at Rosary that the superphosphates gave exceptional yields. Uh, in addition to production having been immensely increased in the best districts and land values trebled, 
poor, poor soils have been improved substantially and the owners blessed with unexpected prosperity. The wheat average has sprung into double figures. Public revenues have been swelled. Railway traffic has increased by leaps and bounds and state finances have become buoyant and cheery. Another practice in regard to which the Agriculture College gave farmers a lead is that of combining land raising with wheat growing. This has proved to be a valuable adjunct to cereal production and the check for sh lamb, sheep and wool is a large one. Superphosphate has increased the pasture value of cultivated land surprisingly. The college is also doing ex excellent work in supplying uh, first class seed wheat Varieties have been improved by selection and then distributed to farmers. Demand far exceeds the supply and purchasers have been well satisfied with results. In addition to the striking influence of the college farm and agricultural practice, much good has resulted through the training of students who have gone to the land equipped with a sense of the value of scientific method in rural industry. So it just gives you a little, uh, an idea from uh, um, his perspective, an overall uh, perspective of, of what has transpired in those first 20 years. Uh, I think it's quite astonishing that uh, the improvement in the, uh, in the soils and the fertility of the land, in the productivity, and uh, it all meant that Gawler was going to benefit because of the general prosperity in, in the rural communities round about. Uh, uh, one of the students at uh, Rosewood, he was a, a chap there by the name of Walter Spafford and he was a wheat breeder and uh, wheat breeding unfortunately, particularly in Laurie's time, got off to a rather bad start um, but they were very conscious of the need to breed new wheat varieties for all the different districts and I think the reason for that bad start was that uh, uh, they, they didn't cotton on to the fact that you could do some really good work with crossbreeding of wheat varieties from different parts of the world. Uh, they rather they thought they might select within their own lines and try and uh, improve varieties that way. It was very slow progress. Uh, but William Farrer I think of uh, New South Wales, who is already in the forefront as a, a prominent wheat breeder, breeder in New South Wales, he showed the way and uh, they followed suit eventually. They started crossing and Walter Spafford helped along the way and new breeds of wheat were being established for the farmers. And uh, when the wheat breeding was firmly fixed as a practice for the college uh, by the next principal, and that was Alan Callahan, uh, then, or the one after, I should say, um, uh, then uh, the, quite a number of new wheat bread varieties were going to be important for South Australia. I'm going to skip over, um, uh, there was a, um, a principal who was uh, followed on from Perkins that was uh, Cole Batch. But we'll, we'll go through to the person um, who I'd really like to focus on as the second principal who made such a difference to uh, Rosalie College and of course the, the, the community of Gawler and the rural community itself. And that was Alan Callahan. And uh, rather like uh, Perkins, he was a dynamo, he was very energetic, and he uh, really got stuck into all kinds of um, agricultural production, horticulture, and viticulture wasn't led by the wayside either. So this is Alan Callahan. he uh, comes from New South Wales, and uh, he grew up and uh, already established himself as a wheat breeder. He was very young when he was appointed at Rosemary. Uh, in fact, he was 28, and, and you could ask questions, why is he a principal at 28? 
But anyway, he took on the job and at that time it was another rocky spell. The previous principal also had problems with discipline and questions being asked in Parliament, should we close down Rosewoodley? Um, so it had been going through a bad spell. The depression was on and so it wasn't a good time for Caledon to, to come in and take over the reins. And just to give you some idea of uh, the chairman of the selection committee, he said uh, to him, well young man, uh, what do you know about farming? And, and apparently Callahan pressed them with his answers and the public service, uh, service commissioner said, uh, young man, either you make a job of it or the government will close the place. So it was up to him to really rally the troops and make sure that Rosemary prospered. And he did, and he did. Uh, he was excellent at engaging the farming community and I'll just read some of the quick uh, few excerpts. Um, in th 1933 the college exhibits stock at the Gawler Show, carried off a number of prizes of for Jersey dairy cattle, Berkshire pigs and South Down ewes. In 1937 Callahan wrote, for the five months from June to October no less than 1,060 visitors were shown our pastures, crops and livestock in field day parties. And then 1939 he said, I have unbounded faith in what Rosemary and like institutions can do by intercalating the proper sense of approach to the problems of practical primary production. Research is the beacon of progress. And in a comment from B.C. Philp, at the time who was a clerk at Rosemary for 45 years, the college did a fair amount of lecturing work to agricultural bureau and we had winter schools for farmers which were attended by 50 to 60 farmers. The Agricultural Bureau had an annual conference at Showtime and one of the visits was to Rosemary College. Up to 200 would attend. And this is a quote from the Bunyip. Uh, Dr. Callahan, principal of Rosemary Agricultural College, told the boys at Gawler High School speech day on Wednesday afternoon that there was, no, that there was room for more in agriculture. He did not like to see the most brilliant students the professions as they were needed, also in agriculture, where special opportunities awaited them. So this just gives you an idea of some of the uh, context that he had. And <coughs> he set wheat breeding on a firm foundation with the establishment of a wheat breeding centre, an appointment of uh, wheat breeders like Breakwell, um, Scott, um, and then finally we. We end up with um, Gil Hollaby in our own time, isn't that right? <laughs> so, uh, Rex Krause. Rex Krause was another one, yes. So, um, and a lot of the, the, the breeds actually were, the wheat breeds were named after weapons. So, you had weapons like uh, oh, spear, trident, Excalibur, rapier, all these weapons. <coughs> and one student just sort of made the remark, oh, we're going to run out of weapons one of these days. I don't think they did, but he was, had a few heavy machinery type weapons, I think, like artillery, and just in case they ran out. Um, one of the things that uh, Alan, uh, sorry, uh, Alan Callahan did do was to appoint a, a, a chemist who revolutionised the uh, enology side of things. That was Alan Hickenbottom, and he took over and really ran the. Uh, the uh, viticulture, the wine making course for the students uh, uh, and following proper scientific methods for investigating, if you like, all the types of factors that might influence wine making. Perhaps we have a few more slides. Uh, here, is, here are the students in that uh, course. John Spafford, who was a student at Rosemary and also a breeder, a wheat breeder, and he became uh, the director of the Department of Agriculture also after Perkins. Uh, 
I think we had at least four principals that became uh, directors of the Department of Agriculture. But this leads us on to another important point that a lot of the students who graduated from Rosemary did end up as agricultural advisors and by this time there were different research centres established all over South Australia like uh, Minampur, Pandana on Kangaroo Island, Kangaroo Island. Uh, there was Kaibibola down south east, the Struan and Tarrafield very close by. And Tarrafield was very important uh, linking in with Rosemary uh, being a, a seed multiplication centre for wheat and then later on focusing attention on um, breeds, sheep breeds, uh, wool, wool production uh, and other avenues for, uh, for keeping that centre alive and they, were, they carried on some really good research. Uh, as well, uh, um, there were some problems with uh, the soil still and uh, so um, Callaghan focused more on use of medic pastures, trying to rotate the medic pastures with the, uh, the crops because if you continuously crop you run the soil down. And this was noted because the farmers used to spot after heavy rain that the, the, so the soil would set fairly hard on the surface and slake. So, and uh, fallowing was on its way out too. Uh, he he, he recognised that long fallowing is particularly was of no use to the farmers and burning the stubble was not a very good practice either. So he advocated the use of medic pastures and so from there and with the Department of Agriculture a lot of different cultivars for different um, places in South Australia were developed. Barrel medic for example of all different kinds. Um, Cypress medic and uh, Gemelon, just two examples. Uh, so these were all developed here and uh, it made the land prosper even more uh, than just merely adding superphosphate. This is an addition to the superphosphate and other practices, of course. Uh, I should mention that Art Callahan was also a firm advocate of horses and uh, he, he rode around everywhere on the college on a horse, uh, checked up on the students. And I'll just read a couple of instances where he uh, met up with a couple of students in an unlikely manner, actually. <laughs> and this is by a student by the name of Peter Brownell. I don't think you'll mind if I read this. Uh, on arrival at the college, Dr. Callahan told us that he would prefer it if we did not drink alcohol on the college, except at social functions, such as the ball. Uh, part of my first week's work was in the vineyards and orchards, and I landed the job of siphoning wines from one cask to another. I was developing a taste for these beverages and had taken in quite a volume before lunch. Walking across the oval to the college building, I saw the dock, that's Dock Callahan, by the way, coming in the opposite direction. To keep walking in a straight line, I kept the top of the building and the top of a pine tree in line and walked straight into Dr. Callahan. <laughs> Uh, uh, and another one, Dr. Callahan followed a, a high code of Christian morality. He did not tell obscene jokes and avoided bad language in the college. He recalled, As I walked past the ablution block, I used to be horrified at the futile bad language that seemed to come to me at the end of the day showers. Company at the, at the, once I heard Come out of the shower, you stunted little squid-eyed bearded runt. What a telling description, without any bad language. I use this to good effect as a general assembly to indicate how I will. A few well-chosen words made identification clear. Now, he nearly expelled someone, and uh, he was quite an important person, as he as it turned out to be. And uh, this was Jack Redden. I don't know if you've heard of Jack Redden. Some of you, some of you are nodding your heads here. So, uh, now, he, uh, the reason for his near expulsion, I should say, was the use of bad language. Now, I'm not sure if that's true. I'm just quoting here Jack Hill, 
managed the horses at the time. He told, this is Jack Redden, told Jack Hill off for always whinging. And uh, this got back to uh, Dr. Callahan, who had to make an example of Jack. But the housemaster fortunately intervened and persuaded Callahan not to expel him. Jack became ducks and the later became two good friends. <laughs> but I, I should read a little bit more because this just gives you an idea of what happened to. Am I running out of time? No, no. I'm just, I'm just watching my camera. Okay. Uh, this is what happened to one of his students that nearly got expelled. And I quote here to him. Jack Redden has a distinguished career in agricultural and interstate, particularly in relation to the many aspects of our meat industry. While a student at Rosemary, Jack was a member of the Premiership cricket and football teams, captain the first team to bring the intercollegiate shield to Rosemary, and in his final year became senior councilman. On graduation, he began a close association with Mr. Dawkins and his new board, Dorset Owen Stud, and then married into the family. In Jack Redden's association with the famous new board stud for 30 years was not only his interest, he was a prime mover in the formation of the Australian Gold Dorset Association, writing the constitution and serving a two-year term as president. He was a member for over 20 years of the Australian Society of Breeders of British Sheep and was a past state president. president. He became involved with the local state school, Gawler Show and the Agricultural Bureau of South Australia. And Jack Red Redden served on the Rosemary Advisory Council and extended his interest in education as a representative on the Standing Committee, inquiring into edu agricultural education in South Australia. Jack Redden was an extremely approachable, pleasant personality who made many friends in the industry, as well in the Rosemary Old Collegians Association. Uh, I think he was also chairman of the State Land Committee too. But anyway, that just gives you an idea. I think it uh, typifies a lot of the uh, uh, the people that were trained at Rosalie, who went on to become advisors, uh, settled here in, in the Gawler community, quite a few of them, but also went on to become advisors with the Department of Agriculture. And you could trace their history or their, what they've done at all different centres in South Australia. And it was quite common for advisors in those days, in my day, when I was with the Department of Agriculture, to have been through Rosalie. And so that contribution for Rosalie set them up uh, <coughs> to engage farmers in each different district. And uh, <coughs> of course, uh, some of the courses that uh, Callaghan wanted to promote and hadn't really been promoted at that time were in extension, uh, rural sociology and farm management, uh, rural economics. So all of these courses, courses came in uh, as a result of uh, the push from uh, Alan Callahan. So he really contributed a lot. And of course, Alan Callahan went on from Rosalie to be uh, the director of uh, uh, the Department of Agriculture. And he was also the chairman of the Australian Wheat Board. Uh, this is a salary course uh, in Callahan's time. Uh, this is the light, uh, light horse regiment, I think. Um, Callahan's in the centre, and to the right of him is Alan Hickenbottom. Uh, the gentleman to the right of Callahan is my uh, old boss at uh, the Department of Agriculture, Harold Chamberlain. He was the superintendent of all the research centres in South Australia. He became the superintendent. Gentlemen, uh, one of the gentlemen I know on that uh, little group in Callahan's time again uh, was on the left, right on the left, on the, uh, sorry, on the gone. Gentleman is uh, Michael Hansen, uh, Michael Heisen, sorry, uh, who was the son of Hans Heisen, and he joined the department as a land advisor. The gentleman in the middle there on the right was Henry Day. Now Henry Day, uh, he was uh, manager at Minipur I think for a while, 
they went to Pandala, and he took over Tarrafield. So he was instrumental in forging Tarrafield ahead into all the different avenues of research there. Uh, following on for that, that uh, Callahan's time was uh, um, Bob uh, McCulloch. Oh, sorry, that was still Callahan. Here. I hope it's Jack Renn, is that right? <laughs> In younger days? Uh, anyway. Um, yep. yeah. Callahan was always very uh, prominent in all the sporting events and uh, uh, he wanted to be there, he wanted to be part of the whole team sort of thing. Callahan's uh, missed the total number of students and staff, were quite, quite a large number in Callahan's time. So it's grown from 15 in John Custance's time to several, 200 I think. Activities where athletics was very important too, and they, they competed against teams and go all around and further afield. This chap here, uh, you probably won't recognize, but he was a very important in sheep breeding. Uh, his name was Brian Jeffries. You do know him. Yeah, yeah. Uh, 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 Brian and I formed quite a good friendship, and I often invited Brian to speak to the students, and uh, he was an excellent speaker and really. Uh, uh, he was charged with enthusiasm and passion for his <laughs> subject. Still got it. Yeah, still <laughs> it. And he could, he could run too. First or last? First, first. <laughs> uh, the Premier side, I think, in 1951. And you probably recognize someone there in the center. Play for it. And uh, following on from that was Bob Herriot, who I think was about 1962 to 73. Bob was more an extension man, and uh, he, his speciality was in soil conservation. And he really uh, set the, uh, the state up as far as uh, safe conservation practices. Was uh, another way in which uh, the students engaged with Gawler was through uh, carnivals. Uh, they loved uh, showing off, if you like, in the main street of Gawler. Uh, and there would be parades, final parades, maybe after a football team or something. One. And the cattle show was another way, or the, the, shape, uh, the show at Gawler or in Adelaide. I think it was Cliff Hooper. Who, who lectured in sheep and beef work at the college. So they engaged with uh, both the Gawler show and uh, the Adelaide show. And coming through to some more modern students in the 1970s. Student on the left, uh, upper left, is Bill Close, who, uh, who was uh, a, a Paul Dorset stud farm near here. So we often engaged uh, Bill when he left Rosalie, and I'd take the students out and he'd show us over the uh, Paul Dorsets or the Texels that he had later too. And uh, this is Don Williams uh, with Bill Nankaval and. Uh, Don came in in 1974 and stayed for about eight years and uh, he really opened up the college into a whole lot of different avenues for horse husbandry, for um, 
wine marketing, animal production, agricultural production, uh, the natural resources course started off then. And guess what? We had girls <laughs> for the first time. Started to join the course. What year? Not the worst. I don't think. <laughs> what year? Uh, no, not that much. What year? Uh, 1974, yeah. sorry. Yeah. Thank you, yeah. Yeah. Uh, So you can see some of the, the, the girls there. and uh, They did very well in the course as far as I remember. And they loved playing hockey. And Liz was a member of the hockey team once. And here's Ruth Robinson. Uh, uh, she became the Ducks of Rosalie and received her uh, award from Mark Oliphant, who was the governor at the time. I don't know if you could recognize anyone there, but... Uh, this gentleman uh, is of the famous Dawkins family, uh, Ross Dawkins. Oh, yeah. Yeah, if you might still recall, he, he has a property near here and runs Paul Dorsets. And next one. Can you open it up a bit? Uh, I think the uh, chap on the left is John Dawkins. Just uh, tapping into because what's happened is that we're all uh, spread out now. Uh, my vintage, I suppose, have uh, either gone to Adelaide or gone further afield, or stayed in Gawler. <laughs> uh, to the benefit of Gawler, we hope. <laughs> so um, I just uh, bring up a few. I'm sorry, apologise if I haven't brought your photo up. If you're thinking that you might pop up, some of you might pop up and some of you won't. <laughs> Uh, this is Gil Holloway, so he was in charge of the, or assisted with the plant breeding right from 1961 and became professor of uh, uh, his area. Uh, now, of course, there was another breeding, wheat breeding going on at uh, Wait also, the Wait campus in Adelaide, but this was separate. So he was um, naming his um, new varieties like Spear and Trident, Excalibur. These were names that uh, he attached to his, um, well, to the wheat breeding team that actually produced. And Graham Hyam, I see here, who was also part of that wheat breeding team. Yes. Uh, uh, so if you look towards the uh, back row, of the second from the right, with the gentleman right here with us, Graham Hyam. Is that right? <laughs> I think so. Jack Bramley on. And, and Jack Bramley. Jack Bramley, yeah. uh, This is part of the uh, uh, Gawler Show Committee, Gawler is that Show right? Society. Sorry? Gawler Show Society. Gawler Show Society. Gawler Show Society. Gawler Show Society. Yeah. And this is your well known uh, Peter Jones, who is also sitting next to uh, Brian Tom here. And uh, training. What happened with horses, I think, in those days? Um, to be fair to Perkins and Callahan, they really pushed for a place uh, for horses on the farm. And in, even in 1940, when tractors were coming in, um, Callahan debated very strongly that there was still a place for horses, I mean the draft horses and the Clydesdales on the farm. However, by the time we got to uh, Harriet's time, I think the numbers had dwindled from over a hundred to under 10, I think. And then they picked up in Peter Jones' time because of the horse husbandry course and the, the fact that people were interested much more in other purposes for horses rather than draft purposes. So we had light horses, thoroughbreds, 
Arab horses and goodness knows what, Pete will tell you the rest. Uh, uh, second from the left here is David Tapman. Now David is still in the Gawler community, co community and he, he, he was a member of the Gawler Council, or was, and, uh, and uh, is a preacher, I think, at the Methodist, the uh, United Church. Uh, you might recognize this person. Gavin Riggs, who was the organist actually, so he's still here with us in Gola. Uh, Andrew Yap is in Gola, and uh, he's been very prominent in wine research. And uh, he's still involved, I think, in our, uh, wine research, looking at uh, improving the quality of red wine in particular through something called, I'm not too familiar with this, ultra high, high power ultrasonics, I think they call it. Uh, influencing the, sounds like sound waves, influencing the, uh, the color and the uh, composition of wine. To uh, improve the taste. Peter Dry. Peter Dry also is still one of the longest working, the longest working uh, academics at Rosalie and, and the university over 30 years. So he's now a professor of wine. And uh, he, he lived in Gaul for quite a while but he's moved to Adelaide. And I think you know who these people are uh, Bruce and, and uh, Ken Edwards. Now he he was part of the farm management team, and uh, along with Ken Lesky, who was, a, who was an old-time lecturer at the college, started off early on. But he really pushed the, forward, the college forward into the, the business side, and Callahan promoted that. He wanted the farm not just to be uh, a record-keeping of events, bookkeeping record, but he wanted proper, a proper business approach in farm management, uh, along with rural economics. Oh, what a and uh, the gentleman on the left is uh, Phil Tower, here on the, on the front. He, he, he's a member, I think he's still a member of the Gawler Environment Heritage Association, is that right? So he, very passionate about bikeways and walkways in Gawler. Uh, this fellow, sorry, did not show up very well, but it's Graham Brookman. He was very prominent at uh, Rosemary because he was like a, a liaison officer, particularly for schools. They encouraged schools to come to Rosemary, school groups to come to Rosemary and see what was happening. And he, was, he organized open days and now he's got a food forest farm just very close to Gawler where he raises all these kinds of uh, nuts, walnuts and things and you can go along to one of his uh, training schools if you like. Um, uh, yes. Uh, this, this is an important occasion which Bruce uh, was involved in. Uh, that was the merger of uh, with the Rosemary Agricultural College with the University of Adelaide. Uh, about 1990, is that right? Yeah. I think this probably you signed this at the end of 1989 with Dame Roma uh, Mitchell. And. Uh, it was a uh, mixed feeling time for a lot of people at Rosemary because we felt that we were going to be overtaken by the university. We didn't think we'd have the same, uh, I suppose, uh, kind of community sense of uh, belonging uh, which had formed uh, over the years and partly because people just lived on the college and formed themselves into a community. And when they got out of the community, they really wanted to react with the Gola people in sporting and cultural events and many other kinds of social events. So it's a real mixture and interaction with the Gola community, uh, which was to the better for both, for both Rosemary and Gola. Uh, in the center there on the top, uh, you might recognize that person, Ian Cooper, 
who was also on the farm management side at Rosalie. Now, he's still in Gawler, and he, he um, very passionate about his uh, scout leadership and uh, works with, uh, has been working with the scouts group in Gawler for a long time. Right in the center in the back there is Hugh Rimes. And uh, he was head of the agronomy department at Rosebery and still lives in Gawla. I believe he still manages a, a vineyard which is owned by his son in the Rossa somewhere. John Jones, not living too far away, he, he, he went from Rosebery to Orlando, I think, as the field operations manager. Next one. Next one. No, the next other way. Yeah. Uh, uh, I wonder if you know who this uh, person is. You do? <laughs> you probably do know him. <laughs> Hugh Van Lee. Yeah. yeah, so he, he visited Gola, was here for a while, and uh, I did hear him once say that he regarded Gola as his home. Uh, next slide. Uh, yeah, you and Lang. And Pat, of course, who welcomed refugees. And that was probably another thing that uh, Gawler, uh, Rosemary was able to introduce, if you like, to Gawler. Uh, a lot of students who didn't come from Australia but came from overseas. And it was surprising the uh, way in which Gawler residents opened up their homes to, uh, to overseas students and to refugees. So that, that was really good on Gawler's part and uh, I think uh, it helped us to appreciate you know, uh, where they came from and uh, some of the problems they had. And in particular there was one person here, here in the second on the left, Sarah. And the <coughs> He was in my time in 1982, I think he came, and uh, Don Williams had organized for <coughs> FAO-sponsored people from the Middle East and Africa and India and Pakistan to come uh, for one year in an international dryland farming course. So Sawa was one of these, and, uh, but he decided to go back to Afghanistan. Unfortunately, things didn't work out well for him there, and he wanted to come back to Australia. Uh, somehow we managed to get him back through the Refugee Association, so he settled in Gaul for a while and then moved into Adelaide. Uh, this gives you an idea of the uh, groups of students uh, that came to Rosemary and we try and introduce them to Gaul the people. Uh, you might even recognize me somewhere along there. Not younger. <laughs> Uh, just, as a, just as a side, the, the, the uh, this, this, this chap was uh, from India, and uh, this chap was from Pakistan. Sometimes they didn't get on very well with the, each other, but in this case they did. Um, but one of the remarks that Naidu and Dooley, I think his name was from Pakistan, made was, that, oh, Rosemary, it's so quiet. <laughs> uh, we're used to people, mm. so I, I took him into Gawler and he said, yeah, it's a bit better. <laughs> <laughs> and then, uh, <clears throat> it was actually the time of the Barossa Festival at Tananda. I took them there and they were completely happy. Yeah. <laughs> oh, lots of people, oh, we feel right at home now. <laughs> so, uh, you, it, just little things like that sometimes that you don't appreciate, you know, uh, with people that come from overseas. And uh, Tim, he was at the college, he was from China, 
and he organised for his president of the Agricultural University in China to, uh, to come over here. So we entertained them and looked after them and helped them get to know a few Gola people. And here, uh, just on uh, the last one, I think it probably is, but Turret Field, okay, they're looking at uh, uh, wheat varieties, different wheat varieties at Turret Field and uh, trying to decide, um, you know, um, which is the best variety for a particular purpose. Uh, well, it's still another one, eh? it's uh, Peter again. Thank from the last talk, sure. or several talks back. Yeah. And uh, just what's happening now, <clears throat> uh, you've probably noticed some difference in the students. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, the majority of them are girls that are actually undertaking the veterinary course. So we had sort of whole boys, mixture of boys and girls, and now Virtually on the other way, it's uh, mostly girls that are doing the veterinary course. And last but not least is um, Idris Muzi. We're at the back here a few years ago with his lovely wife, Dori. So uh, in a sense, uh, I'll try to give you an overview of sure. the links between Rosalie Gawler and it was not just the farming community that prospered, but also the social events, the sporting events, the cultural events, all of these added up, I think, to a good intermix between Gawler and Rosalie. And I think both sides prospered, not just Gawler or Rosalie, but we all prospered as a result of uh, this interchange of ideas and mixing. And, uh, and by and large, I think we got on with each other. Thank you. And who in the audience who's a long time member of the Gawler community cannot forget somebody who became very, very important, John, John Chambers, who John established TAFE here, who in the period of time that I was out there as a student was the housemaster. And so many people, as it indicated uh, with photographs there tonight, are uh, still living in Gawler, or close to Gawler, who have been part and parcel of the Rose with the experience. It's my appreciation, as I indicated, to say thank you to you and ask if you would accept a token. Well done.